Well, welcome back to Beyond 28. I'm your host, Mark Spears, and I, I, I sincerely say this, that we're about to hear from one of my favorite people in the NBA, and, and I'm, I'm excited to always mention that this, this, this brother from Oakland is in the NBA. He, he is, and I don't know if he's, he's heard me say this, I believe, but in my 20... Two years of covering the NBA, his road to the NBA to me is the most remarkable. I appreciate that. Like to me, it's a uh, it's one of a documentary, it's one of a movie, it's one of uh, you know, if you believe you can achieve, I guess you could say, right? right. Welcome in uh, Juan Toscano Anderson, second year Warriors guard. Welcome, bro. Thank you, man. I appreciate you having me. It's a pleasure, and I appreciate those words as well. Yeah, man. No, it's um, and, and kind of starting there. I, I was actually talking about you, somebody recently, and they were asking me about you. And I said, and I and I'll let you elaborate. And and your your story. I don't know how you make it a Cliff Notes version of it, but I was like, he didn't put his name in the draft. Like, <laughs> so so for people that don't know, you know, Juan played at Marquette. And did not enter the draft, what, in 2015? Yeah. So I want to see how, I don't know how you briefly tell this story, but tell the story of how you went from not putting your name in the NBA draft to being a second-year Warriors guard. Hard work, man. Uh, just found a different route <clears throat> after college. Like, I just didn't have the confidence or the love for the game to even pursue playing uh you know, after that. So I went overseas, uh, played in Mexico, accomplished everything in Mexico. So I just wanted to, you know, find a bigger pond to go play in or, you know, uh, for lack of a better metaphor. Um, so that's what made me go to the G League and then hard work, man, belief. And I ended up getting invited to Summer League and now I'm here in the league. Yeah. And and, and I'm, I'm going to give some more detail because it's you're, you're humbly telling this story, but Juan played in Mexico for two years and went to the Oracle for a G League tryout. And nobody knew who the hell he was. And if I'm wrong, Juan, tell me I'm wrong. And his energy, his his vocal nature, his leadership caught the attention of the coaches. So in this like G League tryout, shoot, I could have went to this G League tryout maybe. He caught their eye, brought him to Santa Cruz. He makes the team, playing in Santa Cruz. He bet on himself because he had an offer back in Mexico, correct? Yes, and in ACB Europe. Yeah, and and his girlfriend basically like, nah, don't take the money that you've been offered. Bet on yourself, even though the G League pays less than the McDonald's, right? Man, that's crazy, right? <laughs> So he makes the G League team, and then months later, the Warriors call him up for a 10-day. So, so I guess now I ask you again, man, it's um, when, when you think about your story, do you still pinch yourself that you were able to like accomplish something that I, I think is a story of, of movies, a story that is, is, is very incredible? All the time, every day, man. Uh... Sometimes I know people around me get tired of me being so excited about, you know, my position in life and my opportunity. But the fact of the matter is this isn't regular. Everybody doesn't get to play in the NBA. Uh, everybody doesn't get to represent the country. Everybody doesn't or isn't able to you know, have the position I have being the only Mexican in the NBA or anything like that. So uh, it's just a blessing, man. Like I've been in positions in life that, like I've been the guy where nobody knows. I've been in a gym where nobody's, no coaches are calling, no agents, et cetera, et cetera. Like I know how that feels. So uh, just to be a guy that has a name in the NBA, like I'm so excited, man. I, I created a name for myself this year in the league. Uh, you know, people in the league know me, players, reporters, coaches, et cetera. Like it's just, it's, this ain't regular. So I'm not going to, I'm never going to act like it's regular because it's not by any means. I, I, I want to take you back to your early days, man. There, there's a woman whose family is special to the Warriors organization that introduced you 
or or helped you fall in love with the game of basketball. I let let, let you tell that story. Yeah, so I went to I transferred to Montclair Elementary in third grade, and the reason for my transfer was I was at Stonehurst Elementary in East Oakland, off of nine eight. And uh, in second grade, there was a kid. His name I I don't even know he's out there, but his name was Jabari. I remember his name. And he pulled a a little like a knife out on me. And we're in second grade, man. Like imagine that second graders pulling out knives on kids. And after that, my mom was just like, like you got to go. So. Uh, we ended up transferring the following year, and I met Miss Addles. I was going through a lot of stuff in my life at the time, and she could tell. I mean, you know, if you if you're very if you're emotionally available, oh, well, I'm for- a, and, and I'm gonna I'm stop you right, I'm gonna stop you right there. So for people that don't know, Mrs. Addles is the wife of Al Addles, the patriarch of the Warriors, the legendary player, coach. He's been with the franchise over seventy years. He's in the Hall of Fame. So. This is his wife, who was a teacher, yeah. but go ahead. So she was my third grade teacher, and she was just very much emotionally available to me. She understood me. She, you know, gave me extra attention, extra care. Um, and she just saw me out on the playground every day. Like, I'm a competitor. I'm a born competitor. I've always been that way. I love the game. I love sports. So she saw something in me, and she put me in Warriors camp. Um, and from there on, the rest was history. Like, and so thereafter, like everything else was history. I just fell in love with the game and it wasn't soccer or baseball or football and, and basketball anymore. It was just like strictly all basketball for me. And so, yeah, man, I, that was just when my life changed because of her. Uh, also growing up in uh, East Oakland, when I, when I drive, anytime I'm in the East Oakland, man, you see two things that are the black community and the Hispanic community, the Mexican community. Um, you you are have a piece of you in both of those worlds. Um, can we let's talk about your 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 racial background and kind of the the challenges you had growing up, but also the the, the beauty of being biracial as well. Yeah, I mean it's it's kind of it's two sides to the coin, man. Like when I was growing up, um, you know, within the black community, there is colorism. You know, I dealt with that. Um, you know, obviously. I was, I'm not full Mexican, so I dealt with, you know, being called certain names or, you know, being kind of, I don't want to use the word shunned, but kind of like being shied upon because, you know, I'm half black. And so I've experienced, you know, I guess discrimination from both sides, which is cool. Like I didn't, everybody wasn't that way, but, you know, also on the other side, like I could go, I can be in black communities. I can be in a room full of black people and be just comfortably fine. Like, they a lot of people accept i mean you know there's there's two sides to everything so um there was good and there was bad so there was discrimination from black people and mexican people but also like i said i can go and you know congregate amongst black people and be comfortable i can congregate amongst mexican people and speak spanish and be comfortable and understand what's going on and so i think that's the beauty of it like people always ask me you know what do you identify with more and that's a super tough question for me because my whole family is Mexican, you know. Um, so I grew up on Mexican traditions, Mexican culture, all that stuff. But when I went outside, like, I was a black kid. Like, I look black to white America. If I walk out in white America, they're not going to be like, oh, that's a mixed kid. They're going to be like, that's a black male. And also, all my friends were black. I only had two. I only had one Mexican friend growing up. I have another Mexican friend now um, that I met about six, seven years ago. Uh, so I have two Mexican friends. All my the rest of my friends are black. Uh, I identified like from a social aspect. I identify with black culture. Um, I, I watch black movies. I love soul food. I listen to hip hop and rap, all that stuff. So it's, it's kind of hard for me to answer that question when people ask what I identify with more. Like if black skin was a thing, then I would just say, Hey, I'm black skin, you know, because <laughs> I feel like I equally so identify. Make it a thing. Make it a thing. <laughs> hey, no, I so might shoot, you need to make it a thing. You need, you need to trade it. Mark that bro. You right. I might mark that. put it on a t-shirt. Right. So yeah. um, I, I, I actually was going to tell you, I actually grew up in, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, I think I've no, got I'm the listening. best of both worlds, you know, like I've been able to just really have growth and have, uh, 
uh, experiencing just a real, um, just uh, like really indulging in the culture on both sides, man. Like I really, I feel like I'm lucky for that. Juan, Juan, I'll tell you this. I grew up in uh, East Side San Jose. I don't know how much time you spent there, if any. But um, so I, I actually, you know, I'm black, but because I grew up around so many Mexicans, I got like a pass to go to like Pizzeria's <laughs> and like different like birthday parties. And like, so I love Tejano music. Like I love okay. listening to mar- mariachi bands. And okay. so I, I, I think there's also like, you probably have a lot of fun, man, being able to be in both cultures as well, because those those are both beautiful cultures. For sure. That's and that's the best part, man. Like I said, I know it sounds kind of funny, but like I could have tacos one night and then I could have fried chicken, greens, and mac and cheese the next night. You know, like yeah. it you can't beat that, man. <laughs> and that's in my um, house. I can cook all that in my house and I get that made for yeah. me in my house. So it's not like I'm going out to buy that stuff and just indulging in that food because that, those are my desires. Like, nah, this is my culture inside my house where, you know, we celebrate in Dia de los Muertos, but I'm also going to celebrate Juneteenth also. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, hey, man, you got to invite me over one of these days, man, for some tacos, man. Invite I will, man. On taco up. day. I will, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm serious, too. Me too. No, taco serious. Tuesday. We, we do Taco uh, Tuesday all the time at my house. Sure, you could do Taco Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I don't care what day. You let me know. Right. <clears throat> <laughs> well, you you mentioned Juneteenth. Um, was Juneteenth something that you you celebrated that that you you enjoy going to? I, I I know I used to go to a celebration in San Jose, but what, what, did you go on any Juneteenth celebrations growing up? Uh, nah, th- this year, this past year was like my third time. I think I-, I went to a few when I was a kid, but nothing that I can vividly remember or nothing that really stood out. Like my mom used to take us to a lot of festival festivals when we were kids, art and festival, soul festival, all that stuff in Oakland, Juneteenth stuff. Um, but this past year in 2020 was the first time. So I have a friend who's a DJ and, you know, he set up at Lake Merritt and we kind of just put it out to our friends that, you know, we're going to do something, come out, we're going to have food. We didn't expect for it to be as big as it was, but I guess we should have expected that seeing how the protest turned out two weeks prior to Juneteenth. And so uh, we just had a big celebration at the lake. It was all good vibes. It was a lot of fun, man. Like it was a, it was a hell of a lot of fun. And so that was the first time like, I got actually like really participated, put something together, invited people out like uh was a was a vital piece of a celebration coming together, you know. Yeah. How how familiar are you with the holiday and the, the meaning of Juneteenth? Um to be honest, quite honest with you, that's Sometimes I'm ashamed to say it, but like my father wasn't in my life and that's, you know, my black side of the family. So when it comes to like my black history and, you know, black culture, like I don't I don't know much. I don't know. You know, I know some and I don't know how to gauge how much I know, but there's a lot that I'm missing out on. Like, I mean, for instance, I just watched the movie Boomerang for the first time a year ago. You know, that's that's something I should have watched you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So, oh, man, yeah, just putting stuff in perspective oh. like that, man, like. Uh, coordinate. Yeah. Now you understand coordinate. Right. So, you know, <laughs> it, it, there's certain things that I just I just missed out on growing up. But, you know, as I become more in tune with myself and who I am and trying to learn about my culture and my history, like I am teaching myself and and I'm open to learning about everything, you know, so. Mm-hmm. For for those that don't know, um, Juneteenth is a American holiday celebrating the emancipation of those who had been enslaved in the United States. Uh, it originated in Galveston, Texas, uh, annually on uh, June nineteenth, uh, and is uh, celebrated throughout the, uh, the United States. It's it is the commemorating the anniversary of the date of June nineteenth, eighteen sixty five. Uh, proclaiming freedom from slavery in Texas. So, I mean, um, one thing, um, do, do you think it's important for the NBA and the Warriors to recognize this holiday? 
Yeah, of course. Why wouldn't it be? The the NBA is dominated by black men. The NBA is it's no NBA, and you know I don't know how I can say this without you know offending anybody, but keeping it a buck, there's no NBA without black men. You know, you ain't gonna you're not gonna you're not gonna reach the standard uh, that you have that we have now. Like, there's no uh, you know there's no other LeBron James out there. There's no other Steph Curry. There's no other James Harden out there. Like, yeah. ain't no other Kyrie out there. So. Um, I think the players are, you know, obviously there's a lot of moving parts and everybody has value, you know, like our guy, Eric Housen, he's our equipment manager. He has just as much value as anybody else in the organization, you know, but with all respect to Eric Housen, you can replace Eric Housen. You can't replace Steph Curry, you know? So, um, and and like I said, with all respect to Eric Housen, I admire what I'm just using his, him as an example, because, you know, I play for the Warriors and I'm trying to put it in perspective, but I got the utmost respect for Eric Housen, but you can't replace Steph Curry. You can't replace Clay Thompson. So, um, I think in situations like this, you know, it's kind of like, you gotta, you gotta really support the players and the NBA does a great job. It's a player's league. They really support the players. Um, there's a lot of, you know, players association, all that stuff. Um, but I think I think it would be really good. I think it would be really uh, progressive. Um, and I think they, they would be leading by example if they, you know, went on to, you know, celebrate Juneteenth and, and, and make it a thing. I mean, because, well, we got Black History Month. That's one month out of 12 months. Like, and every day is Black History Month for me. You know, I'm proud to be Black every day. Yeah. The same way I'm proud to be Mexican every day. And yeah. so I think... We deserve more. I mean, we got Fourth of July. We got Columbus Day. We got Veterans Day. We got, you know, I shouldn't say Veterans Day. My bad. Let me let me retract that one because they're a black, white, Asian, all that. Um, but you get the point that I'm trying to make. You know, we got Christmas. We all, a lot of these yeah. are pagan holidays. You know, so, um, I you know what's wrong with with honoring you know black people, African American people, and I think that that would be really great. I think it would be good for the NBA, but it would also be very uplifting for the black community also. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, you mentioned um, before Juneteenth last year, you, you had your, uh, um, p- after the passing of, or let me rephrase this, the murder of George Floyd, you, you had a peaceful uh, march uh, uh, in, in Oakland around Lake Merritt. Clay showed up, Steph showed up. What, what are your biggest memories of that march and what were you guys hoping to the message you were hoping to give people that day? Uh, my biggest memory is just like all of it, a com- compilation of all of it, like Steph coming out, Clay, Loon, D. Lee, um, and then all the people that came out. Like I never expected that many people to come out. So that was really cool. But I just, you know, there was so much going on in downtown Oakland at that time. There was, you know – a misconception of, you know, whether it was peaceful protesting, whether people were looting, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, so we kind of just wanted to put something on, lead something our own. You know, there's a lot of youth in Oakland and my friends and I, we have a really good grasp on, you know, the the younger generation, you know, between like 17 and 30 ish, you know, um, and we just wanted to create a space for people to come out and express themselves. You know, we wanted to express ourselves, but <clears throat> we wanted to bring everybody along as well, whether that's, you know, chanting, whether that's, you know, just being there for support, moral support. Like, you know, I cried when George Floyd died. Like, that could have easily been me. You know, that man screaming for his mama. And I'm, you know, I I wouldn't say I'm still a mama's boy, but I've been a mama's boy for, you know, my mom is the most special person I have in my life. And so... I got a lot of, you know, all my, like I said, all my friends are black. That could have been my black brother. You know, my best friend got, you know, dreads and he a little more hood than I am. You know, he don't, he don't get the same pass that I get when I'm walking through the airport. Like people feel a little more comfortable around me because I'm lighter than some of my friends. And that's, you know, that's fucked up. That's messed up. You know what I'm saying? I don't like that. And I'm, I'm conscious of that. So I, I did. I felt the type of way about, you know, the stuff with George Floyd, because that could have easily been me or my friends. And so, like, round back to my point, you know, just, we just wanted to create a space for people to come out, create something positive for Oakland, because Oakland was getting a lot of like, oh, you know, it's violent protesting, looting, this, that and the third. And so uh, 
yeah, we put on something very peaceful, something, you know, with, with, with a lot of magnitude. Uh, and, and I thought it was really cool. I thought it was really beneficial. Like, I don't have all the answers, you know, of how to, for the solution to these problems, but if we can come together and, you know, create ideas and support one another and be a community, you know, then we can start, I think we can start combating the problem. Strength in numbers, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> um, <laughs> couple more questions. How has your platform grown since your second season? Like you're, you mentioned that, uh, players around the league, media know who you are. Well, the Bay knows who you are more now, too. So so what is it like now when you're home, when you're walking the streets, when you're when you're out, and how much more power does your platform have now, and, and how do you use it? How can you use it now? Uh, walking the streets, I don't really like no more just because, like, I'm so used to just walking the streets and just being like, honestly, when before I got to the NBA, like I, I actually drew a picture. It was just of a kid with headphones on a backpack and a basketball. And it was like these big buildings in the in the background. And like, that's how I always envisioned my life, because that's what it was. Like I was just traveling the world by myself, you know, headphones on with my hood on my backpack, my basketball, like just going from point A to point B. Nobody knowing me. I just felt like I was moving in the world you know, invisibly, which was, was cool for me. Like, I liked that. Um, like I said, there's always two sides to the coin and being famous and have, or I don't want to use the word famous, but having notoriety and being, you know, people knowing you, it's cool. And it's a lot of fun, but it also comes with a lot of responsibility too. Like I can't just talk how I want to talk. You know, when I'm with my friends and we walking through the mall or walking through a grocery store, uh, I can't just, I can't just do anything. I can't just walk down the street and not be bothered. Like there's some days I'm having a bad day and I just don't want to take a picture that day. You know, uh, I'm human. Right. And so, um, those seem like minor problems to people, but when you're dealing with them all the time, every day, um, they become a little overwhelming. And so I'm learning how to deal with that stuff because it's all new to me. Like I said, I'm used to just walking around like an invisible person. You know, nobody paid attention to me before, which like I was cool with, you know, um, and so that's been a little different, man. Um, but it's a lot of fun. It's cool. Uh, I go places and people know me. That That's cool. But like I said, I, I just would prefer the kind of just live my life without being bothered so much, you know. And, and I know that sounds a little like I don't want it to sound arrogant because by no means am I an arrogant person. No, it's just I get like, it. Some days I just yeah. I just want to be known for playing basketball. Like I don't want to deal with all the other stuff, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, it's too late. <laughs> yeah, it's, too late. it's way too late now. But it's a gift. <laughs> I, I thank God for it all the time. It's opened a lot of doors for me. It's allowed me to meet a ton of people, uh, so many different opportunities, and so I'm very grateful and appreciative of you know the Lord's. Yeah. You know, He's He's graced my life. Yeah. No, I, I get it because you you certainly enjoy your anonymity. And uh, like my sister, man, she calls me a C-list celebrity, right? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, but i like, dang, C-list. She's like, yeah, but you on the list, though. She's like, right. I ain't even on the list. Like, yeah. right. I, I get her point by that because it's like you, you like I got friends who they'll be like, yo, man, we, we you should probably not go here or you probably should. And you... I'm sure you now are realizing you, you probably had to trim your friend list and be careful who's in your circle and maybe even, and to, you could tell me if I'm wrong, my, my, uh, sadly, maybe distance yourself from folks, not that you don't love them, but you got to protect your career and, and what you, what you got going in your life too. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm just in a different space in my life now, you know, um, and, at a different place. Like I have a lot to lose, uh, so much more to gain though, you know? Yeah. And so I, that's how I look at it. Like everybody's like, you, you got a lot to lose. And yeah, I have a ton to lose, but I have much more to gain than lose. And so, you know, I have what I have. I have a guaranteed contract next year. And if I just keep 
everything around all the people around me that are no good for me, then I'm going to just have this contract and be out the league next year or in two years or whatever. But if I just protect my mental health, my emotional health, my physical, all of that stuff and protect everything around me, then like I can go on to play six, seven, eight years, maybe provide myself, you know, with so much more outside of basketball. And so a lot of people around me did it to themselves, though. You know, uh, I was it sucked in the moment, but I look back and say, you know, I was lucky to get waived in 2019. I was lucky to get waived at the beginning of the season in 2020 because I got to see a lot of people's true colors. You know, a lot of people just kind of went missing after I got waived. You know, a lot of people was like, oh, you on two way like you ain't even on real contract. And to me, it's like I'm still in the league. What you talking about? Like. You know, why, why <laughs> yeah, you yeah. shame somebody for being on two way? You know, what a hell of a, yeah. You know what I'm saying? You're so, not even on one way. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah, a lot of people did it to themselves, but you know, things happen for a reason, and, and life unfolds as it as it should. You know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in that. I'm a firm believer in the Lord's guidance, and so, um. You know, I don't fight it. I let it happen as it's going to happen. And, you know, I got to live my life. I can't be too concerned about what other people are doing and how they're, you know, treating me and how they're viewing me. I just got to worry about, you know, myself and how I'm going to protect myself and prepare myself for the next day and, you know, to continue to evolve and progress in life. Yeah, because it. I remember Chauncey Billups. I, I used to cover the Denver Nuggets during Chauncey's early years. And it was a blessing and a curse for him to play for his hometown Denver Nuggets. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a it could be a blessing and a curse for you, but you seem to have a good handle on the blessing part and how to keep things from being a curse. You know? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, like I love playing for the Warriors and I love everything about it, but sometimes it, it becomes a little overwhelming. Like all the stuff we talked about, you know, all my friends and family want tickets, people and, and my thing is this, like I tell people all the time, like, you can't have everything. You can't have free tickets and then, you know, get this, that, and the third, get free access to this. Like, I can't give you everything. The only person that can have everything that I've earned is me. You know, I can't give you, yeah. you know, all that stuff. And so that that kind of rubs me the wrong way when people feel entitled to all my, you know, earnings and opportunities. Yeah. I took you to a youth practice once. <laughs> you know it's crazy man well well let me ask you yeah yeah we, that's a longer conversation for another day too we'll have fun talking about that but uh i do i, I want to what about my last question is um juneteenth where's the picnic at this year lake married again y'all doing it again or what's the deal so unfortunately, man, I'm gonna be leaving out of town. I'm headed to Europe for FIBAs this year, so I won't be celebrating Juneteenth physically. But you know, on social media and all Twitter, all that stuff, I'll be spreading awareness and doing my part. But unfortunately, I can't be there physically, so I won't be partaking in any activities this year, Mark. Unfortunately. Okay. But what what would you say to um, as, as people? I I I think America whether it's the Tulsa Race Massacre or or Juneteenth, whether they want to or not, they're they're learning a lot about black history and other cultures that they probably didn't know. Mm -hmm. Why why is that important to learn about other cultures? Um, And and do do you agree with that? Do you think like, hey, people didn't want to know this stuff before, but you're going to learn now. Like what? Right. What do you think about the state of things today and how it is not just a black culture, but like I think America is being forced to learn about everybody else, too, right now? Yeah, Um, I think it's really important. I think uh, I I believe in. Like my whole motto in life is just for allow people to be happy and do what they want, you know, as long as they're not doing anything detrimental to their own health or anybody else's well-being like allow people to be them and be happy. So if black people want to party and celebrate and, you know, promote their history and all that stuff, then by, by any, by all means, allow them to do that. You know, we don't, we don't sit here and be like, Oh damn, Mexicans get Cinco de Mayo and Dia de los Muertos and 
damn, white people get July 4th and this, that. Like, we not out saying <laughs> tell people not to celebrate their history. So, I mean, America's the land of the free, right? America's the melting pot. America's the, you know, where everybody dreams of living, more or less. You know, I've been all over the world. People dream of coming here because they believe it's just like, the promised land they believe like they can come here and be you know liberated you know be free and so allow people to be free man allow people to be happy allow people to be proud of who they are in their history and so i think it's very important we have a lot of you know i'll speak for myself as a black man i don't know much if anything about my black history you know so we have a lot of young men out here being i don't want to say guided but misled you know, there's a lot that I learned in high school and middle school about history. And it ain't nothing in there about, you know, black culture at all. You know, we don't we don't learn that stuff. And so I think it's very important because to know yourself, you have to know yourself. You have to know your history. You have to know every. You know, you got to understand where you come from. You know, I, I understand why I'm a hothead and I'm spunky because my mom is like that. I got that from my mom, you know, <clears throat> So that's just a, a, a small example, but I think it's very important for people to, to understand their roots, man. I think that's, um, I think that'll help you understand your perspective on the world as well, and 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 be able to you know share that knowledge and stuff with the younger generation. Because if we don't do it now, then it's gonna it's gonna keep being um, I guess removed from the history, removed from the from the dialogue and us speaking about it. You know, like if if twenty twenty didn't happen, where would we be in twenty twenty one? You know, would we even be talking about Juneteenth and Black History and trying to like there? There's just such a strong push for us to you know really. I don't want to keep using the word promote. I want to find a better word than that. But for lack of a better word, just promote our history, promote our our culture, promote us coming together, you know, and right. educate. And all yeah, educate. All, all our edu- yeah, educating people. Exactly. Um, if, if last year didn't happen, would we even be making such a strong push for it now? And so sometimes like we got to look at ourselves as a black community, like we got to do this cons- consistently. We can't just wait. And until something bad happens and then there's an outrage like this needs to be a consistent. um, We need to be consistently educating ourselves and our youth and our, you know, our babies about this stuff. You know, you you born in this world and the first holiday you remember is Christmas, you know, which is fine and dandy because everybody remembers Christmas because there's a huge celebration for it. But shit, let's have the same celebration for Juneteenth. Let's have the same celebration for Martin Luther King's birthday. You know what I'm saying? All those things. So um, I just think it's the effort and it's the 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 energy we put into those things. And, and my last question, for you somebody said that listening who well, has. Part. You're right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, I'm, I'm just done then. <laughs> I'm done. But no, I'm going to I'm 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 leave people with this. You're right. You're right. You're right. And I'm glad you checked me on that. <laughs> nah, I'm go ahead. I'm going to leave him with this. This is my last one. My last one. What advice would you give somebody who was a long shot like you, who is a long shot like you were? You know, uh, the first one would be, you know, be yourself more importantly, because that's who you that's 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 who you were born to be. That's what God made you. You're, you're unique in your own way. Be yourself always at all times. That's the first and most important thing I would tell people because I feel like that's where that was always the common denominator in every situation that I was in, whether it be, you know, in a in a meeting with people, whether it be in a basketball locker room, whether it be hanging out with people, like I was just always myself, and people can people can feel authenticity and they can respect that. Secondly, like be true to yourself, you know, and being true to yourself is having a vision and following that vision and believing your goals. I mean, it sounds so cliche, but nobody's going to have the same vision as you because they just can't see what you can see in your mind, what you're manifesting. You know, and so there are going to be a lot of people. I mean, there were a ton of people who told me not to go to the G League. There were a ton of people who told me not to even go to camp with the Warriors. 
you know, oh, you're not going to make the team. Oh, they got a full roster, this, that, and the third. Like, all right, okay, end. You know, so just be true to yourself, man. Be yourself, you know, always believe in yourself because at the end of the day, as selfish as it may sound in this world, it's truly you. You know, you're living the life. You, you know, there's going to be a point in time where people, maybe you may pass before some people you truly love in your life, but there's going to be a point in time where those people are going to leave you probably. You know, there's going to be a time, there's going to be a time where you're disconnected from those people. Like my mom's, I lived with my mom up until the point I was 18, but until I, I mean, to the age of 27, I was living in different countries, 26, I was living in different countries. So I had to go and figure out how to be myself without my mom's guidance, without my mom's advice, without my mom's, you know, personal care and all that stuff. And so you always have to remember that it's you in this world and it's, it's your life to live. So, you know, just to make it short in a nutshell, like I just would always tell kids, be true to yourself. And that means be yourself and always believe in yourself. Juan Toscano Anderson. Thank you. I appreciate you, That's Mark. It. Thank you for having me, my man. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting on that call from the tacos, brother. It's good, man. I got you. So I'm moving into a new place next month. And after I get settled in and back from Europe, we can make that happen.